Hi, I'm Trey Price with Surface Water Solutions. Welcome to our next HECRAS video. Um, this is actually a bit of a prequel. We're going all the way back from scratch, um, starting with just Google and downloading HECRAS. Um, the reason I'm doing this, we've got about five or six different uh, HECRAS courses from basic 1D and 2D, uh, sediment transport, dam break, hydraulic structures. Each of these courses um, starts you from scratch, uh, essentially, and we go through the process of downloading and installing HECRAS and make sure you're up to speed on getting uh, RAS Mapper imported. And what we found is that those who have taken one or two of these courses end up having to sit through uh, the same lecture multiple times. So I've just figured I'm going to put this out there on YouTube. We'll make it free and um, everybody can have a look at this. Um, in the end, what this gets us to is the step where we're ready to start our model, whether it's a 1D model, a 2D 2D model, hydraulic structures model, whatever it is you want to do. Um, essentially these days you're going to want to have HEC RAS uh, open with RAS Mapper so that everything can stay geo-referenced. So just to give you a preview of what this video is going to cover, um, first we're going to just walk through the process of downloading and installing HEC RAS. We will grab some terrain and projection files, then set up a folder structure. We'll start a new HEC RAS project, um, put the unit systems in there, open up RAS Mapper, set the projection, get our terrain imported, and then add uh, the web imagery and some static imagery. We'll check it, make sure it's good before we're ready to go, and then we'll be ready to start our model. So let's dive straight into this just starting with Google. Now you may already have these steps taken care of. You may already have HECRAS installed on your machine. Um, in that case, just forward to, uh, through to the topics that are relevant to you. Now the first thing you're probably going to Google is going to be the term download HECRAS. And of course that should take you straight to the HEC web page. I wouldn't download it from anywhere else. There are people out there trying to charge for it. This one will be absolutely free for you. And if you click on that, it should open up a window for you and bring you to the core engineers website. Now I recommend grabbing the one with the example data sets that way later on when you get into some more complex modeling like linked 1D and 2D coupled models, uh, you'll have some examples available to you with these things already set up. So when you click the download button down in the lower left, you'll see what's going to get downloaded. You probably want to set it up to just open automatically um, when it's done. That way it will execute automatically. Um, otherwise, you can just open it straight from the download folder once it's done. Now, once you do that, it'll walk you through a couple of questions and uh, most of them you just hit next and proceed through the steps. Now, once you click on it, um, it should open up and extract by itself. Um, there are a few things I would probably want to put out there as a warning, though. Make sure that you're running a 64-bit uh, Windows operating system and make sure that you've installed all of the updates. Um, just agree to the conditions, go ahead and go to the next screens. I do recommend uh, clicking on the desktop shortcut and adding it once it's in there to the taskbar and to your frequently used programs. Um, the, if you have a 32-bit system or you haven't installed the latest uh, updates from Windows, including um, the latest .NET framework, uh, you may end up with some issues where you're not able to run RAS Mapper, which is a 64-bit program. Um, it'll just walk through the rest of these. Um, I'll just fast forward through this while it copies through, um, just in the interest of time. And there's no licensing requirements on this one. So once you hit finish, you're good to go. Now you should have a new icon, and so once it's installed, all you're going to do is just click on the Windows button, and there you go, you've got new software. So when you click on this and open it up, it's going to ask you a couple of questions. If you didn't install the data files or the example data sets, um, it'll tell you how to do that next. Um, you'll also see the unit system uh, come up here in your default. Now mine's already in an SI units. Uh, yours will probably default to US customary. Uh, from the very get-go, whatever you tend to work in most, go ahead and change that. Um, let's go under options and have a look at the uh, unit systems. It's, uh, it won't keep this toggle on even once you've toggled it. Um, it'll go away again, but just whichever one you're going to work in, uh, hit OK. Now our tutorial models for our classes are always set up in SI system, so that's what I'm doing here, and you'll see what it defaults to right here. Okay, so now the next step on this one, um, I'm going to table this for a minute uh, now that we've got this open and installed. I do recommend before going any further though first, uh, open up RAS Mapper and just make sure that it opens for you. Uh, if it doesn't open, then you've got some other issues that you're going to have to solve uh, with some IT support or making sure that your Windows is up to date. 
So with that, the next thing I wanted to dive into, before we start downloading or opening files or starting new projects, um, I'm gonna go back and cover a couple of suggestions on the folder structure. So we've got this manual um, that um, I think I've got a version of this one that's uh, where the first workshop at least is available to download for free under surfacewater.biz slash workshops. What I'd recommend though is before you start with anything, set up a folder structure that's gonna make sense to you. So right here, um, I've got one suggestion, but your IT department or others might have other uh, recommendations uh, to be consistent with how your geospatial data are uh, organized. But I'm gonna suggest putting these seven folders, or subfolders, underneath of a project folder that sits right on your C drive or somewhere where you can run the model without going to a network drive, with Without going to iCloud or without going to OneDrive, if you try running it on these cloud servers or these uh, network-based servers in the beginning, uh, you're going to have some issues. So I would go ahead and start a brand new project, a brand new folder, um, and put that underneath the C drive. So I'm just gonna go right here onto my file explorer directly under the C drive and make a brand new folder. This is the folder where I'm going to store everything related to this project that we're going to be setting up. Now you can call this one whatever's most relevant for you. Uh, in our case, we're going to be setting up a model of the Brisbane River. So I'll put that in right now, Brisbane as my folder name. Now underneath this folder, I'm going to put in these seven folders, uh, these subfolders that I've listed here. And um, as I type each one in, um, I'm going to explain a little bit about what each one is for. Um, aerial photos, if you've got any static aerial imagery, um, I wouldn't use the big ECW files or anything else there, just something that is uh, the static images that correspond to your particular site area. Uh, for hydrology, this will not be your full hydrological model. This is just the boundary conditions that you're going to use in the hydraulic model. Um, land use, um, in HECRAS terminology, that refers to roughness. So if you've got some shape files of the roughness coefficients, that's where you can put them. Um, number four, the projection. I recommend putting one single projection file in this folder um, and only one. That way everybody knows what your projection is going to be for this particular model results. Um, HECRAS is going to make its own results folders for you, but this is going to be the one that you're going to save for delivery to a client or to the stakeholders um, that's going to be renamed to the uh, naming conventions that you'd like to see. Uh, the terrain is pretty self-explanatory. We're going to put terrain files in that folder and then anything that you've already delineated with a shape file. I'm going to make this shape file uh, subfolder, um, keeping in mind that now in the latest version of HECRAS you'll actually also get a folder called features and um, that will be there and that will have the um, shape files in it that you create directly in HECRAS. Um, now this I number these one through seven just so they come up in the top you're going to have hundreds and maybe thousands of other files that go into this folder and so to keep these other folders and files separate from the ones that you have defined I like to keep these numbered so they stay up on top. So at a bare minimum, in order to start a project that's got, uh, that's geo-referenced basically, you're going to need two files. You're gonna need a projection file and you're gonna need a terrain file. I'm gonna show you a couple of data sources for uh, grabbing terrain data for free. Um, it's going to be different in every country and you're going to have different um, repositories and different um, uh, free DEM sources and paid DEM sources that you can grab from uh, your own local councils, your own government um, or private entities. In our case, the model that we're going to be setting up is in Australia, so I'll show you some Australian data sources here and you can just substitute these with your own. Now one very handy repository um, that uh, I guess I will mention for the globe, uh, if you just type in open topography, I think this is a San Diego State uh, uh, server that um, hosts all sorts of uh, topo data that's available for free. If you click on that one, it, um, it'll take you to some data sources, um, go into your uh, raster data, that's what you're going to want for HECRAS, and then you can uh, find the SRTM data right here, which uh, the S stands for shuttle mission, and basically anywhere on the 
the planet, you can then grab your terrain data. Um, that's, uh, that's something that might not come in in the right projection for you. Um, you might need some GIS skills to uh, figure out how you're going to project that out to a flat surface from the spherical coordinates. Um, but uh, and, and again, the SRTM data, that's at a 30 meter resolution. That comes in at one arc second, I believe a 60th of a 60th of a degree around the planet. And that's not going to be good enough for anything, any, any channels that are of, um, you know, smaller than a couple hundred meters in width. So uh, it's great for catchment or watershed delineations, but um, other than that, it's just kind of background data that you might want to use. You're going to want something a little more accurate. So I'll show you with Australia where we can grab uh, data that comes in up to about one meter by one meter pixel. So if you just Google uh, Australia elevation data, um, I like this one here, uh, Elvis. Uh, that's the one where I go to grab most of my Australian data. Uh, easy to remember with the funny name. Uh, when you click on this one, it's going to take you to the um, spatial reference system here. Um, you can click continue, and uh, this is going to walk you through the process of um, figuring out where you're at uh, in Australia and where we're gonna grab the data. So I'm gonna zoom in here. Um, um, the project that we'll be working on is in Brisbane along the Brisbane River. Uh, I don't want to get too urban, so I've gone upstream a little bit. Uh, we'll zoom in on this one here. It's the Gold Creek Reach of the Brisbane River. Um, and uh, I think Gold Creek is this tributary right here that comes in. And this is what I've been using for some of the online courses. Um, it's got a couple of, it's got some big rivers, some small rivers, a little bit of urban, a little bit of rural. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, and so that's what I've uh, provided provided to you for any of the online courses that we take, but I'll show you how to get it for yourself as well. So if you wanted to get this whole watershed here, um, you know, you could, you could uh, maybe grab a little bit larger area than I'm showing you here, but what it's going to check for you is uh, what data you've got available. Now, down to one meter by one meter resolution, you've probably got uh, thousands of tiles. Well, here we've got 844. So this is a, an 844 square kilometer area, and these are going to come through in uh, one kilometer by one kilometer grids at uh, one meter by one meter resolution. Now, if you had 844 of these things to deal with, you may want to use some stitching software. You could do it in NetGrass. I've actually done this in RAS Mapper and stitched together an entire one meter grid. Ends up being a couple of gigabytes in size. What I'm to have you do just for the purpose of our uh, online tutorials is to just grab this one because there's only one um, at five meter resolution. So once you grab this one and hit download, it's going to ask you a couple of things. Now it's going to ask you what coordinate system you want to be in. Uh, you may not know that quite yet. Um, I will show you uh, just uh, shortly here um, where we're going to look up these map grids. In Australia, we're pretty much always going to use these UTM zones for the MGA uh, GDA 94. Uh, in our case, it's going to be zone 56 for Brisbane. Now you've got a couple of choices in your output format. You could get an ASCII grid. I'll show you what those look like. I, I like the GeoTIFFs, but it doesn't give you much uh, ability to edit those later on. Now I'm in engineering and I'm just putting my uh, info uh, um, email address in here and confirming that I am a live human and it will just start the extract and tell me that it's going to send me an email. So I check my email, it tells me my data is ready, and um, watch out, you don't want to download the file that's down here at the bottom. Uh, well, you can download it, but that's not your data. Your data is right here. If it doesn't come through in a live link, you can just take this, uh, put it into a new tab, and it'll be a zip file that's going to ask you where you want to download it. So um, I'll just fast forward as this thing downloads and um, show you where it showed up in my download directory. So it's going to call it like a clip.zip, clip some number.zip, and you can then just uh, unzip that one. Um, I'll just put it right back here under the same directory, and then you can see what it's called. Now, I do recommend um, going in and renaming this one once you've got it. Um, you're looking for uh, a couple of things. Number one, it's going to be the ASC file if you've downloaded it as ASC or as a TIFF file, depending on the format that you chose. Um, in our case, I chose a um, actually a TIFF format, and I'm going to go ahead and rename that one. Um, to tell me something about the file itself. So mine again has this uh, clip name. What I'm going to call it, I'm going to go ahead and rename this one. Um, in our case, this is the Brisbane River at uh, Brookfield. So I'm going to just give it a more descriptive name, uh, Brisbane River Brookfield 
uh, five meters. So it's good to say something about the data source. I'll say this came from GSA, and that way I know the resolution, I know the data source, and I know something about it. If you just call it something generic, it's going to be very hard to remember later on. Okay, so this is uh, the terrain file now. It's a raster grid digital elevation model, and it's projected, like I said, to zone 56. Now let's talk a little bit about the projections, because the next thing you're going to need is a projection file. Now, to me, the best source for projection files is uh, this one called spatialreference.org. You could uh, just Google spatial reference. Remember that a projection file is a uh, spatial reference system, an SRS. So if you just go here to spatialreference.org and um, click on that one, it'll open up a new window for you here with the spatial reference website and a little search bar where you can type in the projection file that you're actually looking for. Now, how do you know what projection file you're gonna be looking for? That's something that you're probably gonna to have to get from the client, from the stakeholder, from the end user. What projection do they wanna see the results in? You may not know that. Um, and if you don't, um, then you might wanna ask some questions around. But um, if you are unsure, then you could just go into a map and typically the UTM zones are the best place to look for where you're going to be on the planet. So if I just Google uh, UTM zones, you can see that it's divided up. I think the planet, 360 degrees around the Earth are divided into six degree increments. So you've got 60 UTM zones. Here are the ones for the US. Uh, the ones we're gonna be looking for are in Australia. And in that case, it's fairly straightforward. You have a set of um, eight projection files that typically covers you anywhere you're gonna to wanna to be in Australia. So this one right here is a good grid for it. Um, if you're in Australia, you can see the eight of them right here. Here's a slightly bigger version of it. Um, 49 is uh, just a little sliver. Uh, in Perth, I work in 50. Uh, out in the gold fields, we'll be in 51. Adelaide gets into 53, 54. Uh, Tassie and uh, Melbourne are in 55, and then Brisbane's in 56. So if I know that, um, and I know that I'm gonna be in zone 56, I can just go ahead and type in right here, zone 56. I'll just type in Australia and see what that gives me. Um, hopefully I'll find the one that I want. And the most recent one, uh, this GDA 94 one, is the one we're looking for. Now, EPSG, uh, one thing to remember here, the P stands for petroleum, and the petroleum industry has a vested interest in being able to go back to a given spot on the planet and figure out where your, uh, where your borehole was. And so they have compiled uh, pretty much any projection except for maybe uh, local project grids, but uh, most projections on the planet have been compiled with an EPSG code. I do recommend cataloging that so that you know uh, what you're working in. What you're looking for right here is this PRJ file. So I'm gonna take this PRJ file right here, download it. It's gonna give it this name with the EPSG code. I do not recommend uh, keeping that name. So I'm gonna go ahead and show this one in the folder, uh, grab this PRJ file right here, and I'm going to start now by, with my folder set up and go back to this uh, uh, folder that I set up here under uh, Brisbane. And remember I put a projection subfolder there. I'm gonna paste it in here and then what I'm going to do is keep uh, a little bit of the information. I'm going to right click on this one and rename it. I'm going to keep the EPSG code in here, but I'm going to call it EPSG so I remember what that code is. And then I'm going to give it a name here with GDA94, uh, and this is the MGA zone uh, 56 is what I'm looking for. That was the previous was 55, next is 57. You can get any of these right here. And if you're in Australia, I would recommend just downloading all eight of these. Um, and then somewhere in here, I'm actually going to say, projection file. I'll explain that a little later why I call this, uh, why I actually put that in the name of the file. So with that, I've now got my projection file in there. Let's have a look at this and see what's actually in the projection file. Um, it actually has all this information in it, uh, including what you're going to want to see at the end to check that you're in the right unit system. In our case, we're in meters, and it needs to have a false easting and a false northing in it. Now, I think I'll just deviate just a bit and do um, and explain a little bit about projection files uh, just because it's actually absolutely critical to understand how spherical coordinates get projected out into a 2D plane. Now there are some people who explain this much better than I can. I, I do recommend just, uh, I hope I'll put a link to this in the uh, YouTube description, but uh, just Google why all maps are wrong right here. And uh, watch these guys' video. Um, it just explains how over the centuries, everybody uh, who's been trying to make maps has always struggled with this, trying to take spherical coordinates and put them onto a flat plane. Now I don't know if I can use these little tips uh, like I do in a classroom setting uh, here on a video, but I'll try my best. Uh, in a classroom setting, what I typically do is take a glass fruit bowl or whatever I've got in the course 
course, um, and I put it over the projector that might be sitting on a table. And what we'll do is we'll take this glass fruit bowl, and let's say I draw Australia on it um, with a uh, whiteboard marker here. So I'll draw Australia on this, and then what I'll do is just hold this thing up and we'll shine a light on it. Um, let's say the light comes right from the center. So I'm shining through, I'm putting this over the camera. So there's Australia right there. It's in spherical coordinates and I'm gonna take this little light and I'm gonna shine it up against the wall. Now on the wall, you will see then Australia show up and it shows up then on the wall. If I trace that on the wall, I would be taking a curved surface, projecting it out to a flat surface. I would have a zero, zero coordinate. I would have an X and a Y direction. And with a projector, you'll actually see the pixelation that happens um, and where you can actually, you know, you could assign a spacing or a, a scale to each of the pixels that you see on the wall, but it's a flat surface. Now every six degrees, we rotate. So I'm in a little rotating chair here. If I move around and I'm six degrees off and six degrees off, I could take this wall and or take this screen and I could still project through from this projector out onto this flat screen. Now, the farther I get away from it, obviously the more warped it's gonna get. And once you get 90 degrees off, uh, you're not gonna be able to see it at all. So you can actually reproject things between uh, different projection systems, um, between different zones, but you can't go too far. It's gonna get warped uh, uh, very quickly. So that's just a little anecdote that I use uh, in class. Uh, again, watch that video, why all world maps are wrong, and you might get a better idea for what a projection file is used for. So with our terrain data and our projection file downloaded, we're ready to go. We're ready to start a new HECRAS project. Um, before we go too much further, I guess I did want to mention a little bit about the schematic of HECRAS and where we are in this process. In the end, we're going to combine flow files with uh, geometry files, and we're gonna combine them together into plan files. Overarching all of those um, is the HECRAS PRJ file right there. That's the HECRAS project that we're gonna set up now. And we're gonna pull some maps in, into RAS Mapper before we get into any of this. And uh, that's where we'll be uh, when we end this video. We won't have any of these things set up, but at least we'll be at, a, at the point where we'll be able to start setting those up. So the last thing I need to do here before uh, we dive in and make our new project is to move my terrain file into the terrain subfolder. So I'm gonna take this one that I just renamed to the Brisbane River Brookfield 5 meter GSA dot TIFF. That's a raster grid digital elevation model. And I'm gonna move this over into my new folder and the subfolder that I've created there called Brisbane. And I'll put that under the terrain directory and now I've got a terrain file and I've got a projection file. Those two files need to be in there before I uh, go any further. Um, I do recommend putting this uh, any folder that you're working on under quick access. We'll just pin that right there to my quick access and then I'll be able to see Brisbane every time. Keep in mind HECRAS does not recognize any Windows shortcuts and you're going to need to browse right to the folder. That's why I like to keep it in the C drive and not under your downloads or documents where you have to go to C drive, users, uh, your username, Windows shortcuts and all that. Um, I just like to go straight under the C drive if you're able to. So now we're ready to go ahead and start a brand new project in HECRAS. So you start with File, New Project. And um, under the new project, again, like I said, it can get down here into the user shortcuts, but I like to just go right here to C Drive Brisbane and make sure you see all seven of the folders that you just created. It might default you up here to a OneDrive folder. That's gonna mess you up later on. Make sure you're in the same folder where you've just placed all these subfolders. And I'm gonna make a new project here and we'll go ahead and call this one Brisbane River. And keep in mind that um, it won't recognize spaces as it tries to populate your file name, but they don't have to be the same. You can have a lengthier title here, Brisbane River Tutorial Model, um, and the file name does not have to match. So I'm just gonna call the file name Brisbane. Uh, make sure that this name right here makes sense to you and will make sense to you forevermore because it's going to get replicated hundreds, maybe thousands of times with different file extensions and changing it later on is going to be a pain. So don't call it something that's not going to make sense that you won't be proud to show to a client or a stakeholder later on. Um, changing it around uh, afterwards is a pain. You can change the title easily, but not the file name. I'll say OK, and it's going to ask me this question. Do I want to be in SI units? Yes, I do. Um, and it tells me where it's going to put the uh, PRJ file. So with that, I've now got a project title and a project file name. The next thing I'm going to do is open up RAS Mapper. 
First thing I'm going to do with RASMAPPER open is set my projection. So under Tools, Set Projection for the Project, I can go ahead and grab the PRJ file. Now I'm going to make a bit of a mistake here. You'll see that I did this on purpose. This error, why did I get that error? Well, unfortunately, there's this reluctance to change the PRJ extension. Uh, that's the same as the Esri uh, projection files. So if I wanted to do it correctly, I have to go into my projection subfolder. There will be a single projection file there um, that I can grab and make sure that you see again the units, the false easting and false northing. This is my projection data. There's an unfortunate coincidence that the HECRAS project files, the PRJ files, are the same file extension as Esri shapefile PRJ files. I hope they change that someday, um, but it doesn't seem very likely. So for now, it's very tough to keep those separated, which is why uh, I like to keep my projection file in its own subfolder so that I don't get it mixed up with HECRAS project files. Now, another little glitch, if you're in SI units, you're gonna to want to make sure that you change your unit systems to meters here. Uh, changing it later on can be a bit of a pain. If you're in Europe, you might want to use this alternate HECRAS raster warping method. Sometimes that'll help line things up. I'll show you uh, later on where we get to a point of checking that and making sure that it's working out right. So you say okay, and nothing has changed, but it's now projected. If you you didn't have a projection set and you tried to add a terrain file, it would prompt you to either add one then or to use the encoded projection file, which a GeoTIFF might have embedded inside of it, um, and you can do that as well. So it'll ask you for an SRS, which is the spatial reference system, and if you get that prompt, go ahead and do that. So what we're going to do now is right click on terrains, create a new RAS terrain. Now, a RAS terrain is not a new terrain, like it says here, new terrain layer. You're not creating this from scratch. What that means is you don't yet have an HDF file. HDF is the hierarchical data format. You're going to need to have uh, a third party viewer if you want to dive into these. Not many people need to get into the guts of this, but that's how HECRAS stores most of its data for a 2D model and for any of the raster, uh, RAS mapper data. Again, if you hadn't set the spatial reference system, you would be able to do it here. We have this plus button here where I can now grab any file format. Um, if you look in the HECRAS manual under the help uh, 2D modeling user manual, uh, at the, in appendix B, you'll see about 80 different formats of uh, raster grid data that HECRAS is going to be able to read as terrain data, only three of which will show up right now. Um, if you want to see something that's not in one of these formats, you'll have to use the drop down and uh, grab raster data uh, as startup. Star. So we're going to go into our terrain data. I've got it set up as a GeoTIFF, so I'm going to actually be able to recognize it with these first three file extensions. And I'll go ahead and say open. Now I can open multiple files, and if you watch our videos on uh, putting, uh, manipulating terrain data and modifying terrain data, you'll see how we stack some of these up. In our case, we only have one. I do recommend hitting info and making sure that you can see what uh, the encoded data um, sets are inside of this one. It's got, it'll tell you what the, uh, the MGA zone is, and um, it'll also tell you what the resolution is. Just confirm that that's what you want to do. Uh, I don't recommend using this one if you're stacking data that's uh, different resolutions on top of each other, but if you're tiled, like that 844 uh, tile set that I could have downloaded and that I've done before to merge together, you can go ahead and click that button and it'll make a single raster image out of it or raster uh, terrain out of it. Now, I could put multiple uh, files in here and stack them up or down um, with this hierarchy. Remember, this is a visual hierarchy, not like Arc or Tuflow or other systems where it's in order of processing and the last thing you see is the one that gets the highest hierarchy, uh, hierarchical priority. Um, this is visual, so whatever is on top gets the highest priority. That's, that doesn't mean on top elevation wise, that just means on top um, in terms of what gets priority over the no data values. So here I've got a file name um, and I've seen a lot of models where people just keep this as terrain and then the next one will be terrain one and terrain two. I highly recommend uh, clicking on this folder button, going into it, uh, the terrain subfolder where we've already got our terrain and then you can give it a name here. In our case, um, uh, it's gonna already start defaulting to the uh, name of the TIFF file that's in there, but this is gonna get a HDF file extension. So, um, and what I actually want to do on this case, so yes, I've pulled this in, but I want to actually specify here that this is the existing condition. So when I put in Brookfield, uh, this Brookfield uh, data, I'm going to actually say existing 
here so that I can differentiate that from any proposed condition terrain that I put in. So now I've got this uh, bit of a longer file, uh, file name here than I had before, uh, but that's going to allow me to um, differentiate between anything else that I might add to this folder later on. Uh, before I hit create, I did want to show you this rounding precision uh, because we will uh, open up a couple of these ones and show you the guts of what's inside of a DEM in a minute here. And uh, this will tell you, um, I guess in binary format, how much uh, precision you're going to have on the values that are in here. So when I hit create, it's it's going to walk through a process here and sometimes this can take 30 seconds sometimes this can take 30 minutes sometimes it can take hours depending on how big your uh, terrain file is in our case we're gonna just watch this for a minute here it should be done in just a second so ours took 20 seconds and um, I want to open up, um, you know, you see some nice colorful image here, but I want to just show you what HECRAS has just done with these files as well because it's important to understand this so when I go into the Brisbane folder, and um, again, I have my HECRAS project now as a PRJ file. I still have my PRJ file here, which is my Esri format projection file. But now under terrain, I've got some new files here. And what it has done, and this is important to remember, because once you get many, many terrain files, uh, you may want to clean this out every once in a while and only use the ones that, uh, that you need. This Brisbane River uh, TIFF file that I've downloaded, I no longer need that one for this model. It has actually recreated this one here with another TIFF file, and it has the name of the original, so that you remember where it came from, with a dot separating it from the name of the HDF file that you've given it. Uh, this is a TIFF file right here. It has also made an HDF file, um, which is going to store some of the data that HECRAS needs to reference this, and then the VRT file, which as I understand gives it some uh, information about the extents and the hierarchy and which, uh, fold, which files to stitch together here. In our case, we've just got one, and it's orthogonal. Um, and so it's it's a fairly simple one. Uh, you might have a uh, file stitched together, a terrain surface stitched together from multiple sources, and you'll have many, many files that all come together linked with a single VRT and HDF uh, with multiple TIFF files in the background. Now, before we get into interrogating this and seeing do we have good data, um, I did want to just cover a little bit about the availability of data or the, the acceptable formats for data. Under terrains here, if I wanted to create a new RAS terrain, and again, now that I've got one, um, I could hit add existing, and under terrain, I actually see the HDF file. If you've already done it once, then you can go to add existing. Anytime you're doing a new one from scratch, you need to hit create new. So when I do this and I hit create new, if I wanted to add a terrain surface and and um, look here under this uh, format and say I wanted to grab a tin or some sort of vector format or a point cloud. You're not going to be able to work with that sort of data. So a lot of times your survey data might come through um, as vector data, like a, triang a set of triangles or some other surface. You're not going to be able to work with those, at least not yet as far as I know. What you need is a raster grid digital elevation model. And I'll show you what these look like. I'll open up a couple of these in Notepad here and just show you what it actually looks like. What we've got uh, in a raster grid digital elevation model file, um, and again, this is the format we could have selected um, in a couple of the uh, different data sources allow you to choose between ASCs, that's an ASCII text file, uh, versus GeoTIFFs or other format. What we've got in our ASCII file here um, is a number of columns, a number of rows, the coordinates of the upper left pixels using the projection that we've assigned, and then a cell size, that's your scale, along with the no data value. If you don't have this header data, you're not going to be able to use it uh, in RAS Mapper. So what I can tell from this one already, this is a two kilometer by two kilometer tile that has a specific corner. You see that it's a zero, zero. Um, and these would line up exactly with the next tile over, which would be another two by two kilometer grid. Um, and then it would have the next coordinates over. You can actually edit these in, uh, in ASCII format and just close this and you would actually be moving this thing around or you could rescale it if you needed to. When it sees this negative 999 right here, every time it sees that value, it's not going to be negative you know, 10,000 meters below sea level as an elevation. It's going to ignore that and see right through it to the next terrain surface down in the hierarchy. Or uh, if it's just no data, watch out, you're not going to be able to put a 2D area over the top of it. So that's why I like to take the 30 meter um, resolution data and just take any areas where I've got missing data or no data values and just put that underneath of it in the hierarchy so at least I've got some data there.
Now this one looks pretty clean, but um, here I'll show you another one where it's not really organized quite as nicely and the no data values in some programs, I think this comes out of ARC, go all the way out to the design cube, the maximum extensor of your design cube, and they take that. So this one's got some values in it. It's got no data values. You can see that the no data value right here has got this big number. Um, well very uh, big negative number and every time it sees that it's going to see right through it but then even the numbers themselves if you look at this I mean how much resolution is in there and how much wasted file size is there um, if these are in meters there's your millimeters you know we're out past the nanometer um, that's really not going to be necessary which is why you can take sometimes very large files that come from other programs and when you pull them into heck RAS, if you use the default one over 128 sometimes it shrinks them down in other cases it might add something to it but you can change it to uh, up and down depending on the resolution that you need. In our case for this one, uh, that's perfectly fine to the millimeter. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to be that accurate with our hydraulic modeling anyway. So you might have some data that came from a surveyor that's in a irregular grid. So you might they might have skipped some points because of some brake lines. You know, they might have coded in a roadway surface or an edge of pavement. And because it was flat, they just skipped a bunch of points. And it's going to fill it in with these triangles if you have the brake lines. So that's an irregular grid. That's a tin. You can't work with that. Heck, RAS um, in RAS Mapper is going to take uh, a regular point cloud um, and convert that. If you're going to have a raster grid DEM format, uh, it has to have already been converted uh, into something that's got a regular orthogonal shape to it where every one of these points is laid out in a regular grid spacing. So you don't get to skip any grids here. Now, once you dive into it and zoom in on it, you might see that HECRAS has displayed it as a tin, but again, it's based on these regular point networks. So that's what we're stuck with right here, um, and at least for the meantime. And I'll show you just real quick on the HECRAS uh, help menu where you can see the formats that are acceptable. We open up here under help and go to the 2D modeling user manual. And if you just zoom to or scroll to the end, you'll see down here in Appendix B, you've got all of these different file formats that uh, that it'll recognize. And again, Chiho TIFF being one of the most common ones, um, ASCII files as well. What you'll notice here though, is some of the ones are not listed. I don't know why they haven't put this in alphabetical order, uh, but if you're using Civil 3D or uh, even 12D, some of these packages can export a .dem file. You have to choose the resolution, but when they export the .dem file, sometimes that comes through as ASCII text. And it doesn't tell you that that's one of the accepted formats, but when you add it, it'll come in just fine because it is ASCII text. Typically, I recommend asking the surveyor for this. Um, if you've seen Jimmy Fallon do his double translation songs lately on Google Translate, it's kind of the same thing. A lot of times you'll have a surveyor who starts out with some surface, cuts it into contours, and then people will use the uh, contour to raster or topo to raster command to turn it into a raster. Don't do that if you can help it at all. Here's a quick example, I guess, um, that I wanted to show you then. Um, you know, if you had a surface and you cut contours off of it, and then you use these contours to go back and make a surface that you're gonna display as a regular raster grid, you're going to miss everything that was in between those contours, which you may have already had picked up from your surveyor. So you, you're gonna be missing some of the data and what you get out of it, um, having started with a surface, gone into the contours, and then come back to a surface, that's a double translation, and you'll end up with all sorts of missing uh, resolution. And again, just to give you a visual of this, we'll do this in the class sometimes, is we'll throw something into the uh, English to Albanian translator and then bring it back from Albanian to English, and uh, you see that you get all sorts of uh, messed up phrases when you do a double translate. So uh, try that one just for fun. Now again, just to drive this point in, to make sure that we know what's, uh, what we've got, what we're working with, I always use these kid toys here uh, in the classes. If I'm trying to uh, generate a terrain surface, and say these are mountain ridge lines and rivers going through there, this is what we're left with, okay? These are individual pixels. Now I can't use a point cloud. This has to have the header data in it as well. HECRAS is only going to store X and Y coordinates, or the, the, the um, DEM format will only store the X, Y coordinates of this particular pixel. The rest of these are just Z values, Z values here in Australia. Um, we know the number of rows and columns, and so that tells it when to start repeating these. But the rest of it, like we saw in that ASCII file, is just a list of elevations. You only have a single X and a single Y data value listed. All the rest of these values right here, 
These are only Z values. There's your only X and your only Y in the whole file. So it ends up being a fairly efficient format, even though it's you know repeating some information in between areas where it's absolutely flat. You're gonna have a value everywhere. And we'll see that uh, in this particular terrain data set, we're gonna see some areas where it is absolutely flat. So let's check our data and just make sure that the terrain data is good enough for us to be able to use. And in order to do that, we're just gonna cut a couple of cross sections and see what we're looking at. Now, if I wanted to model, say, a development along this tributary, um, maybe I'm interested in how wide the floodplain might be and uh, whether I've got this modeled correctly might uh, depend on whether I've got enough resolution in my channel. Now, let's zoom in on this and see what we're looking at, um, just to make sure that uh, we've got the resolution we need. You see these kind of tiles going on here. Yes, I've got this thing at a five meter resolution. If I click on my measure tool and come across here, I've got a five meter by five meter pixel here. And like I showed you in that previous model, we've got one point for each one of these pixels and Hecras has displayed it with some triangulation. That said, all it has is a single value, a single elevation value for each of these points. But you see this tiling right here? You can tell that this has been sampled down from the 30 by 30 meter data set. So this is not going to be as accurate as you might think. But let's cut a cross section here and see if I was putting in a development right there, you know, am I going to be able to reflect this channel properly? So what you're going to do is double click at the end of your measure tool and you get this menu that allows you to plot the terrain profile. Is this enough resolution? I don't know. It depends on what you're looking for. To me, this looks eh, it looks fairly good, um, but you may want to go out there and ground truth it and uh, figure out, you know, did it properly reflect the channel banks, uh, you know, the slope of the channel banks, or did it miss it because it was shot from space or from an airplane or from uh, a drone? You know, did it filter out the vegetation properly? Did it get bathymetry in there? Let's have a look at the Brisbane River itself. Um, if I'm trying to map this floodplain uh, for the Brisbane River and I come across and uh, do a cross section like this, what you'll notice when I plot the terrain profile, it's absolutely flat. Now, how many riverbeds actually look like that? So we know by looking at this, well, the LiDAR didn't shoot through the water or they've gone in and replaced it. And one of our exercises that we go through is to actually add the bathymetry back into the Brisbane River. Um, in both our 1D and 2D modeling classes, we go and, uh, and modify the terrain so that you can do that yourself. So that's one thing that I like to check uh, is just, did you get in sufficient resolution out of your terrain data? If at all possible, ground truth it. Next thing I like to check is go into your map layers and I'm going to go ahead and add uh, web imagery to see if I'm in the right place on the planet and make sure my projection is correct. Um, I like doing the hybrid in the beginning, not necessarily for figures later on. I'll use Google Satellite or Bing Satellite, but the hybrid at least will give you some uh, points of interest and put the text on there for you so that you can see what you're looking at. In our case, I'll zoom out on this one just to show you um, once we click on this one, um, you won't see anything underneath this. So I turn it on, turn it off. It looks like it's in the right place, but in order to see through it, double click on your Google hybrid and let's scale down the transparency here a bit and uh, that way you can see them both at the same time and see how those line up um, you know we could uh, do a tighter check on that but it looks to me like we're in the right place if you see the Sahara Desert or an ocean out here then you've got some issue with your projection file now this is relying on an internet connection to give me this Google hybrid view. If you want it to keep looking like this and you don't want to rely on your internet connection and you want it to look that way, say you uh, present this to a client or a stakeholder and you don't have their Wi-Fi password, it's going to look like this. And if you've set it up and you wanted it looking like this, then you probably want to do some saved views. So say your project was right here. Um, if you go to surfacewater.biz slash views, it'll walk you through the process of doing this at multiple zoom levels. I'll just do a quick one right now. Now, name this view right here, um, we'll just call this uh, Gold Creek, and that view now, no matter what I do, if I zoom out and then go back to this view, it's going to take me right back into this map frame. So I'll double click on that, and you can see it's just going to come right back to it. I could do this at multiple views, but once I'm saved here at this view, I'm going to go into this Google Hybrid um, and export the layer. And I could do this as a JPEG, in which case I'll get a world file, JGW file. Um, I've got a tutorial online on how to adjust those if you needed to make a shift to it. Um, but uh, we'll put this one here as a TIFF for now. And I'm gonna put this under aerial photos. That's where I told you we store our static images. I'm gonna give this a name, Gold Creek Aerial. Say something about the source, Google, and I'll hit save. Now what this is gonna do is at my screen resolution, export me a TIFF file 
that has those same extents. So now under my map layers, I'm gonna right click on it, add an existing layer, and then we're gonna go in here under aerial photos. It won't see them yet. You have to actually drag down. It's only gonna see shape files as existing layers until you get common raster files. Again, you might have to go to other if it doesn't list them here, uh, but there's your Google image. And again, it comes through with no transparency. That's a new thing that they've just added. And so when I turn off my uh, Google hybrid right there and only have the terrain underneath it I could turn on this aerial which is now uh, op completely opaque uh, scale it back and you can now see basically the same thing that we saw with the Google hybrid uh, keep in mind though that when I zoom out it's not going to add anything else to this so when I turn off my Google hybrid you won't see any terrain data behind it okay um, so I've only got it right here I'll turn that back off and show you the it's just to the zoom extents see that so just the views that I saved to uh, so there's nothing outside of it and if you zoom in you'll notice it gets very pixelated so if I wanted to see this building right here and I wanted to turn on something that's going to show me a little more resolution I'd have to go back and do this again save another view here at this resolution and then you'll see that Google is going to be able to pyramid that and give you better resolution the next steps then um, after this is going to be setting up our geometries so what we'll do here then in our uh, classes um, we'll go ahead and start with the geometry and we can add a 1d geometry a 2g geometry get our uh, structures built in uh, but because this is the common point where we split off in each of the classes I wanted to make sure this video is out there for everybody to see um, one other thing I guess I would suggest being able to do from the very get-go is uh, make some profile lines and save shape files for them so there's three different ways to make shape files in RAS Mapper, and each of these is covered in our workshop document. Um, what you can do then under profile lines uh, is delineate these using this plus button, use the profile line tab. Um, two things I like people to be able to do from the very beginning uh, is to be able to do a uh, center line, you know, a channel line right here. I won't go all the way down through it, um, but delineate anything that you've got for flow paths. These will be useful for break lines later on. You can save this and give it a name. This will be uh, Brisbane River CL. And the next one I'll do is a cross section. Make sure you always get in the habit of delineating cross sections from left to right looking downstream. And likewise, uh, river center lines, get in the habit of delineating those from upstream to downstream. So I'll do one here called a cross section. And then later on, we'll use these to interrogate our results. So there's my cross section. You can see it gets stationed or changed there. And here's my uh, center line. Now these, once I've drawn them, I can actually export these to a shape file. Two other ways to make shape files in a RAS mapper. One is right here under map layers. You can do create a new RAS layer right here, generic layer. It can be either point, polyline, or polygon. You can do the same thing here under features. So you can create a new layer, point, polygon, or uh, polyline. And this one will show, shove it right under a new directory called features. Uh, this one will put it under your master directory, which I, I don't really like to do that. Um, it, it, it gets lost then. Uh, I like to keep them here under features. So this is my preferred way to make uh, shape files. Anything that you've delineated external can also be added here. If you've pulled it into GIS already, if you've delineated it or got arc hydro or something doing flow paths and watershed or catchment divides, um, you can actually add all those in. So I do want to walk through the process of at least building one shape file just so everyone's familiar with the editing tools. In this case we'll just call it a catchment or a watershed and um, I'm going to go ahead and make a polygon uh, shape file using this add new features button which it defaults to. Now you know we, we could be very precise about this I'm just going to just do it generally to show you um, how we're going to set these things up going forward. Uh, as I just start delineating around, um, if I did get out to the outside of the uh, watershed here, um, then when I get to the final point, I'll just double click and that gives me a shape. What I do want everybody to be familiar with, and we will delineate things um, for each of these classes separately, you know, um, center lines for the 1D class with cross sections, 2D areas and break lines in the 2D courses, anything that you edit and delineate in HECRAS, uh, in RAS Mapper now, you'll get these editing tools. 
And so with those though, the one thing I wanted to make sure that everybody understands is how to edit the vertices and how to add things. What you're gonna do is go to the second toolbar right here and double click on the feature. In that case, you can add vertices, you can move them around, you can delete them. Um, just get familiar with those um, before we start our classes and that way uh, everybody will be up to speed. And then whenever you're done editing, you can stop editing and um, save those edits if you like or discard them if you don't like them. Now, another thing I wanted to make sure everybody can do is to to, uh, edit the properties of any of these layers go ahead and double click on any of these things here play around with each of these the terrain uh, surface symbol settings and all these things that you can do here one thing I really like is this update per screen which allows you then to see all of the resolution when you zoom in it just gives you even more um, contrast between the higher elevations and the lower elevations so play around with each of those settings, add the contours and the hill shade. Um, if you highlight these and then use your middle mouse button, uh, in some cases you'll be able to scroll up and down through these and see visually uh, how these are gonna look at different uh, intervals. Now, one last thing I wanted to cover is something I forgot to uh, mention in the very beginning. Right here, this description, never ever leave this blank. Uh, in the manual, I list a couple of things that you might want to include there. Uh, for instance, um, the project purpose, um, maybe your name and contact info, um, the, the date that it was put together. Give us some information about this. Um, the reviewer will thank you for it later on. Feel free to go back. I know some people have said I speak too fast or I cover too much information. Um, hopefully, uh, YouTube format allows you to stop and pause and uh, watch things again if I have covered these things a little too quickly. And likewise, if I've gone too slow, for you you can just scroll ahead so with that then just to summarize uh, where we're at with this thing I'll pull our uh, somewhat ambitious uh, agenda here and uh, just make sure that we've covered everything so we downloaded the Hecaraz installed it um, grabbed our terrain files and projections um, set up a folder structure started the new Hecaraz project uh, made uh, the new unit systems in our case it was SI opened up Raz mapper to set the projection pulled some terrain in added web and static imagery and then checked the terrain to make sure it was good now you are ready to model so again I probably should have posted something like this from the very beginning because uh, this is an exercise we go through multiple times uh, in every single class and that way if it's out there I can just tell people this is required watching beforehand that way um, if you already know this um, you're not wasting your time waiting for everybody else to do it and if you don't know it yet um, then uh, you only need to do it once and then we're ready to go because once we've got this terrain in here um, this is the sample project uh, that we use uh, for each of our online courses so um, if you are signed up for one of those I look forward to interacting with you live uh, in these courses uh, sharing screens and doing the things we're able to do that way I do hope I get a chance to meet some of you face to face as well uh, as we do our tours uh, worldwide for courses covering any aspect of um, hydrologic or hydraulic modeling. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel, or uh, if you also go to surfacewater.biz slash subscribe, you'll get newsletters um, covering uh, new tips and tricks, uh, how to do things in HECRAS and other software, and especially GIS software that's uh, useful in being able to interrogate the results and um, set up your initial files. With that, I'll go ahead and sign off. We'll see you next time. Thanks.